Great. So yeah, thanks for the questions. We're getting uh, lots coming through. So I appreciate that for everybody and yeah, getting the conversation going. Um, we have so we have one more presentation with us. We've got to talk about digital pest management systems. Um, again, like I mentioned at the beginning, I think it's a um, yeah, I say a growing market. I'm seeing more and more of our members certainly utilizing um, digital systems. So yeah, if I'd like, I'd like to in, invite Sean Lopes from Secure Choice. Um, if you let me get my screen, there you are, Sean. I've, I've got you now. I was on. I've got these different screens around, and if, if people keep jumping from each one, <laughs> <laughs> are you, you doing well? Yes, yes, good, thank you. Excited to be here. Thanks very much for taking the time. It's been a really good talk so far. So yeah, some some hard acts to follow. Really interesting stuff from Matt there on the, the silverfish. I've got to do a talk uh, in Germany later this year on the grey silverfish. So I might be talking to Matt about some extra points on that as well. So yeah, interesting right. stuff for me too. Fabulous, good, good to hear. Well, um, you know, Sean, I'll leave you to do your introductions and yeah, tell us a bit about these digital systems. Great. Um, so hopefully that's come up okay for everybody. Um, yep. So I'm Sean Lokes, uh, Technical Manager for the UK and Ireland for uh, Syngenta. Um, so I'm standing in today for Gary. He's out doing an installation today or overseeing an installation. So he's out having fun in the field and I'm here with you guys. So if you have any really difficult questions, then I'll put those forward to Gary, but hopefully between myself and Richard Mosley will be able to handle uh, most of the stuff you've got. So yeah, without any further ado. So yeah, we're gonna be talking about Secure Choice, the Syngenta uh, monitoring system. And what our thoughts on uh, rodent detection are that it should be smart, cloud-based, data-driven and compliant. And um, so just to kind of frame the discussion first, I guess, is that we, I think we're looking at a digital revolution in pest control. And so it'd be interesting to see in the chat other people's feelings about this. But if we look at any other industry, they've undergone a digital revolution. So um, there's lots of different things going on. Are we looking at that for pest control or do we think that that's not going to happen for us? And another thing to think about, what do we need? So what do we need to, to come in this space for it to be for it to be useful for us and for it, us to add value to our to our customers? Um, so did we need TomToms at the time? So when, when they first brought to us uh, satellite navigation, did we think that's something we needed? I think most people were happy with maps. You didn't really think you needed it. And then you started using it. You were like, actually, that's a lot easier. There's a lot less maps. I don't argue with my partner so much because I'm not having to tell them they've got the map upside down, that kind of thing. So it saves a lot of domestic uh, heartache having a TomTom or a now a, a Google or an Android phone to tell you where you're going. Um, did accountants need electronic calculators before the 1960s? I spoke to an old accountant, which is always a very exciting thing to do, about the advent of calculators. And they said they used to spend days doing all the calculations. Um, that's that's all they did. And then when they had electronic calculators, it massively reduced the time they needed to do that. So they weren't spending less time doing accounting. They were just doing different things. They weren't doing long hand calculations. They were using a calculator and getting the same work done more accurately and more rapidly. Um, and why do so many people wear heart rate monitors? So I don't wear a heart rate monitor, but I know most of the people I see out and about do seem to wear them now. So they're capturing that data 24 hours a day, logging it. Why do they want that? Why is that interesting? What are the health benefits going to be when we have that data for huge swages of the population in 10 or 20 years time? So just really interesting things where we've seen industries already move to digitization and, and some of the value that's been brought and some of it that's yet to bring. And then another question, are, are, are smart energy meters a good thing? So I think that's probably, would split the room. Um, some people would think they're terrible and other people think it's great. You can monitor exactly what's going on in your specific home, monitor what you're using and you can cut back where you need to, or you can boil the kettle one more time if you've got a little bit of budget left in the day. Um, and what do we get? What do we get for pest control? And hopefully that's what I can talk to you about, um, secure choice. So yeah, secure choice is for rodent monitoring. And just to take it to the basics, um, we're looking at dual sensing technology. So it's it's sensing in two different ways. So it's not taking any images, it's, it's monitoring motion and it's monitoring vibration. Um, and it's plug and play. So you simply plug it in and it's, it's ready to go. And it's a cost effective um, remote monitoring for rodents. So you don't need to be on site to be generating the data. It's constantly coming to you uh, wherever you are. Um, and the sensors automatically uh, capture rodent activity. So again, you're not needing to be do it. You set up the monitor in the right place. And when there's activity, and that's logged and sent to you directly via an alert. Um, once rodent activity is detected, yeah, you get you sent your alert via email and that's in real time. 
um, and all the act that activity can be viewed on an online dashboard so you can optimize rodent control so for me there's kind of two points to this there's you're receiving that alert and it's saying right okay that's that's happening right now i can go and action that and then that data becomes useful in the moment but it's also for me almost more exciting when we look back at it so when we've been using these kind of platforms for five years or ten years that data to an end user to a facility management company or to a school is really really useful and interesting because they can they could almost use it to say right well we need to improve this building because for the last 10 years we've had rodent activity in this area heavy rodent activity like 35 percent more than we've had in any other area of the site so they can maybe get budget to do better proofing or budget to do those necessary improvement works that need to be done to that to that facility building so for me yes it's really important to get the alerts and to view that in the dashboard and see all that kind of thing but i think when we can look back on this data set in a longer period of time that's going to be really really interesting so we can say these are our higher pressure sites and maybe you use that to steer how you charge your customers if you have one site that's consistently um, having higher rodent pressure you know you're going to have to be putting more effort into those so for me, I think in the future, when a pest controller gets up and if you had some rural sites, you've got seven different places to go today and some of them are 10 miles away, some of them are 20 miles away, you're spending a lot of your time in the car. So isn't it the right decision to know which site you want to go to first because it's got the highest pressure activity over the weekend. So you're going to hit that site first and actually the last site on the list, you don't need to see them. And then maybe at the end of the year, you can charge that site slightly less and the other slightly more based on that. So these are all areas that are up for grabs, but I think we're going to see a big shift off the back of this kind of technology. Um, just thinking about when we're placing the, the sensors. So I think there will be some threat in the industry about uh, digital tech and what it's going to do and how it's going to revolutionize the industry. Um, but for me personally, I think I see it as the kind of the core skills of pest professionals are going to be more important than ever. So I'm not saying it, but it could be said that anyone can throw down a bait box, but actually the skill of the pest controller is in understanding pest behavior and positioning the control methods to optimize efficacy. So that can't change. I think, you know, monitoring outside of bait boxes requires even more skills. And if we take the example I drew late last night, so it's absolutely terrible of a room with a dead fish in the corner of it on a workbench. Um, if we placed monitor near a food source, um, with edge effect, edge effects or at the edge of a room, a monitor right in the middle of the room with no nothing around it, there's no table or chairs or anything, and another by a door. I think you guys in the call would probably mostly know better than me which of one of these is going to see more hit rates. Over time, you're probably going to see a lot less at this one because there's less reason for the pests to be there. So where we place our bait stations and where we're doing our monitoring or our control options is really, really important, and that's the skill. And without you guys knowing that skill set, you can't do the job, whether it's with whether it's with control options or whether it's with monitoring options. So for me, that doesn't change. And so I wouldn't see it as a threat. I think it's it's about investing in those skills and making sure that we bring those with us into the digital revolution as well. And um, so in terms of sensing, um, so yeah, each sensor has a dual mode of action. So you can see here, this is what the, the sensors look like. So really, really easy to use. Um, and essentially they're monitoring two things. So monitoring motion. So I've done in late last night some things. I think these are gonna work. Oh, look at that. Okay, so rodent moves under the sensor and essentially going through a beam, a bit like uh, James Bond sort of moving through a laser field, except the laser field is kind of pretty impenetrable. And when the rodent moves through it, that is sensing. So something moving through the field is essentially going to give you a hit. That's that's a motion. And then the second one would be vibration. And I think I couldn't really find a good vibration animation. So it's just a flash there. But essentially, that could be a trap going off in the box, or that could be um, I was speaking to Gary late last night about the potential for including sensors near glue boards. So if, if a sensor is on a bracket above a glue board and it's physically attached, then when a rodent is on a glue board, it's going to be making that vibration when it makes contact. So that could give you a hit. So if you've had set your sensor just to vibration, then that could be a potential option for the future. So it's the two sensors. You can switch between them and you can adjust their sensitivity. So um, you can adjust the vibration sensitivity to nothing so if you were in a site where there's lots of forklifts going past in a busy warehouse and you're constantly getting vibrations set off the sensors in that situation you would consider turning off the vibration sensor so just going from motion of a rodent physically going through that that wall of sort of um, infrared beams but it gives you the options and you can kind of play around with those and find exactly what works for you best to have them both on but if you're in a situation where you're getting false positives then you can use that turn down that vibration yeah, and they can be used for rodent traps and bait stations. 
Uh, so when they're activated, the sensors automatically signal the hub. Um, so you can see that little antenna there, it's going to send a message to the hub and an alert is sent to the subscribers via email. So you can set up who are the subscribers, so that can just be you as a pest controller. But if you have um, uh, a client who's very interested or they're very on this kind of thing and they want to know as soon as something's happened because it's due to reputational reasons, then in theory you could set them up as an email as well so we could go to them. And then, yeah, you can go in and do a response or you can you can plan your actions. Um, so the sensors are battery operators, so they don't need any power. Um, and they come with a nine year lifespan as well. So you can sort of use them for a long period without worrying too much. They can be fitted to existing rodent monitor stations um, or inside our own bespoke stations that we make. Um, and they can also be bracket mounted without the need for bait stations at all. So I think I've got a picture of that later. But for me, that's really, really exciting, especially when we're talking about things, you know, there's big things in the industry, there's always problems, but behavioral resistance is something they're looking at more and more. I know in London, there's some areas where it's very difficult to get a rodent to go into a bait box. So how do you monitor it? How do you control it if you can't get it to go into a bait box? Well, these sensors you can set up on a bracket in, in a popular run area, and you can be monitoring that without the worry that they're um, going to be that can be worried about going into a bait box because you're just setting it up over a bracket and obviously that that PIR beam is still shooting down anything that comes through it it's going to sense that so it, it gives you wider scope so I think most of the time most people will be using them in a bait box because it'll be easier but if you need it in those certain bespoke situations it can be a really really powerful tool for that monitoring and so you can go in and take actions as you need so yeah in terms of monitoring does that give us potential to do glue boards it's not work we've done work on yet. We know it does work in practice, but we want to do more to look at how that is going to fit in. Can they be used in live cave traps? So if you're doing larger animal trapping, you might be able to reduce the amount of time that the animal's trapped for because you've monitored it on the sensor. It sent you a message and you know which sensor to go to and which trap to go and check. As again, see streamlining where you're traveling. So if you've got to check 10 traps today, much better that you go directly to the one that's caught your fox or whatever you're going for straight away. Um, entry points. So maybe there's entry points to a building that you're not able to proof uh, for whatever reason. Um, and maybe there's just no way to proof it or it's not possible to proof it. You need to have airflow coming through and there's always going to be a rodent issue there. So in that situation, you could put your sensor set up there so you can monitor for whatever's coming in. And yeah, we've talked about already, bait box shy rodents is another option for the future. So there's some really, really nice applications of this outside of our normal use patterns. Um, it's really, really easy to install. So we talked about the sensors before. The other part of this is the hub. So this is the part that's going to receive all those messages that are sent. Uh, so you plug it in, switch it on, and the hub automatically establishes a wireless network uh, with the internet. So it's not going to be going using the facilities. So sometimes companies' IT departments will be quite upset if you say, I just need to connect this device to the internet. So actually, it's just like a mobile phone. It's got a SIM card included in it, and it's going to be sending that just to the satellite or receiver, just like your mobile phone would. So it's just on all on mobile phone signal there. So then those data packs are being sent up by the hub up to the internet. And then that's obviously can, being pushed down to your to your tablet or your phone or your desktop, whatever you're viewing it on. And a single hub can have, um, you can have a single hub or you can have multiple hubs and the data representation will always be the same. So it doesn't matter if you're talking about a tiny room with just one hub and lots of sensors or whether you've got a huge facility that's got loads of different hubs connecting to thousands of different sensors that all gets displayed in the dashboard in the same way it doesn't matter which hub is plugged into to which sensor um yeah any hub can receive information from any number of sensors so as long as they're all in range then um that's fine and i'm not sure what gary said exactly the range was i think it's kilometers on open terrain but obviously once we bring in uh, different materials then that's going to be reduced so it's just about finding how many hubs you need to to house what you're going on so if it's a you know a thin walled warehouse then you're probably going to get away with one hub more easily but if there's lots of denser materials you might need more but gary knows the more specifics on on that one um, if the internet is um, interrupted for any reason, the hub will retain that data that it's receiving. So the sensors keep sending it in um, and then it automatically transfers it to the dashboard when the internet is, is re-established and it keeps its original date timestamp. So when you look back at that data, you know, a year later, 10 years later, it won't give a really clustered effect. It'll just be with the original date stamps on, so it'll keep it um, accurate. Um, there's loads of features to support you as pest controllers. Um, so this is the, the dashboard example. So you can put an interactive floor plan, drag and drop. So if a facility's got a floor plan or you've got a floor plan, you can upload it. And then onto that, you can 
put where your sensors are. So you've got um, you've got in the green, you've got the sensors, and the blue would be the hub. So you can see where they are around the building. So you can just upload that document. So it's really, really nice and easy. And you always know the status of your site monitoring sensors. So it tells you the status. If something goes wrong, if a forklift runs over one, or somebody breaks it, or it's run out of battery, it's gonna it's gonna tell you on here. So you'll be able to to, to be aware of that, and it's gonna send you a notification to to take action. Um, yeah, the location of the alarm is instantly visible, allowing for you to target investigation and treatment work. So if you whether that's a hit, so you've had rodent activity or whether it's an issue, you know where you need to go to to deal with it. And it also um, generates a heat map, which helps you visualize activity over time and demonstrate the effectiveness of the control programs you've put in place. And you know where the rodents are, where they've been and when then where they're not. Um, so you can see there the example of the, the heat map. So yeah, you've got the different site areas and it's going to show. And you know, the idea of that is again, once we have this information over days, weeks, months, years, we know what's happening. So we know every time it's autumn, we're seeing rats coming into this area first and they seem to move from there. So we definitely need to do more proofing in this area or something like that. Or it's showing over time the different areas of activity. So what's going on? So maybe the facility is being used in a different way to what it used to be. And they're now producing bread in this area, which they didn't do before, which is leading to more rodent activity. So it's really giving us those deep insights because every time that the rodent trips it, that's giving you some data. It's not just saying, yes, there was a rodent. It's saying, yes, there was a rodent this was the time and there was other rodents in the area. So you can start to build a much better picture and a much better understanding of what's going on in your sites. This is just an example of what the bespoke secure choice bait stations look like. So really just a very standard bait station three way there and the sensor would sit over here. So as something's coming through, the beam is gonna be going this way and it's gonna catch something that motions through there. And obviously if a trap is in set in this area, then the, the vibration from that is gonna, um, it's gonna set, send the alarm as well. Um, so the problems. So yeah, there's lots of problems for us as pest controllers. Um, we need to demonstrate our service compliance, demonstrate our industry commitment to modernizing and embracing the change and innovation. So I think we're going to be seeing more questions around that in the future. You know, what, what are we doing in terms of stewardship? We've seen um, the work that BPCA has been doing on glue boards. We've been asked big questions by government bodies. What are we doing as pest controllers? And can we prove that they're a necessary tool and the more data we can collect in this area? I think that's only beneficial for us keeping more tools in the future. So I see digital as a way we can potentially keep tools in our arsenal because we can say, look, pest pressure is very high at the site. This is a necessary tool. We can see that we're dispatching humanely due to the data we've collected here. So there's there's benefits of that as well. Uh, there's knowledge and transparency that isn't available by um, traditional pest management alone. And you can do data-driven decision-making. And, you know, the bigger facility managers and people who are running businesses, they want to kind of see this kind of stuff. They have it for their energy meters. They know exactly how much energy they need to use in all the different areas at the time they can see that live they want that kind of information for pest control they want to be having a meeting with you and you saying yes based on last year since i took over we are 90 percent less pest activity on your site so you can actually give them that matrix and you can send that to them you can generate a report for them to give to their stakeholders and say yeah we are working in this area we're protecting our reputation from rodents yeah, sustainability and stewardship. So um, demonstrating your commitment to responsible pest management and the use of rodenticides. So if you're going to be using an effective rodenticide, which there are times when that's entirely necessary, that we can back that up by saying, look, there's data here that shows I need I need to be using these products and this is why this product is down at this time. And they've got dual sensing technology. So hopefully we can overcome that um, rodent behavioral resistance. So we can monitor them and we can take the actions required. And we're looking to further develop this technology. This is not a space that is standing still for Syngenta. This is not something we're finished with. We're saying, right, there you go, guys, you know, have at it. That's done. You know, we've got support teams in Switzerland and Denmark in the UK. We are looking to grow this offering. We're looking to do more in this space and improve the platform. So it's not 100% finished right now, but it's something we are looking to invest in further and build. And it's a really, really exciting space for us. And we're, we're really happy to be bringing it for you guys. Um, so yeah, digital solutions that Syngenta is bringing. I think the really important things to take away are it's real time and it's historic data. Again, both are really exciting for me, the historic data more so that when we can start to look back, we can really start to pick out those trends and sort of get much more powerful insights. Um, instant alerts of pe pest activity. It's uh, internet of things and cloud-based. So it's, it's sending all that. It's not, you don't need to be there to physically um, accept the data packs. 
um, and yeah, secure choice systems for life uninterrupted. So you can see here, this is an example of it just set up. So this is uh, one of the sites where they're set up. So it's just set up on a popular rodent run that's along here. And so it's outside a bait station and it's just gonna be monitoring anything that, that goes under that sensor there. So yeah, targeted effective detection. Um, it's going to be a really powerful tool for compliance and sustainability. So whether we can in the future reduce the chemicals we use and reduce the chemical waste we generate as well. And we want to be able to protect people and businesses by using smart sensors. So really having at it and reducing that rodent load and utilizing data and an analytics to drive uh, efficiencies. So understanding where we need to target your time because your time is going to become more and more valuable where do you need to be going? What do you need to be doing? If you're spending equal times on all parts of a site, but one's got a lot higher pressure, then maybe that's not the best use of your time and you should be spending more time in those higher pressure areas and looking at why that is and investigating further. So it's it's less time looking at each box because you don't need to look at a box if the sensors are telling you everything's okay. And it's more time doing the work to make sure that everything is good in those higher pressure areas. So it's your same amount of time. You've only got 24 hours in the day, but in the future, I think you'll be spending it differently. Um, so this one's from Gary. Um, Syngenta, I think, does he say DIPM? Maybe DIPM, Digital Integrated Pest Management. Um, it's something we're working with in the pest control side, but also in the agriculture side. They're obviously looking at this kind of technology as well to monitor sort of things like locusts in Africa, monitoring certain crop species that they want to be able to know about early on. So we are looking at in this digital space for lots of things, which is why it's kind of supercharged it for us in the pest control industry as well. So yeah, we're putting innovation and technology in the hands of pest control professionals, um, and we want to drive global pest control. And the way we see it is that secure choice isn't something on its own. You need professional pest controllers, but we combine those two things and we bring those two skill sets together and we think we've got the potential for a life uninterrupted by pests. So that's an exciting future, hopefully. Yeah, so um, we wanna be maximizing your decision-making by using be data to better understand rodent behavior. I think I've flown through that a lot quicker than Gary would have, but thank you guys very much for your attention. And if you have any difficult questions, definitely ping them to Gary, but I'll have a go at the questions now, Natalie, if there's any that have come up. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we have 10 questions in there. So we, we do. Yeah, we've got, we've <laughs> got some. Um, but it, some of them are relatively similar. So I'm going to start with um, so other things like slugs, for example. Um, Colin said that presumably slugs could set off the vibration sensor, but not the motion sensor. I think it might be the other way around that a slug would probably be unlikely to set off vibration, but possibly motion. But I need to speak to, to Gary about that because it might be a speed. So if the slug's going Absolutely. slow enough, it might be like, actually, that doesn't count as probably a, how fast it's breaking the beam situation. But it, again, I'm not 100% on that, but motion, it shouldn't be. I mean, if it's a, I don't think there's a slug big enough. Great. There's a, for all these, any sort of questions like that, I'm guessing they can, there's a, a sort of a, a contact email that you had it up on the slide a moment ago, but I mean, if you can stick it in the chat section for any, yeah. you know, if people do want to um, elaborate on any of their questions, um, they can they can get in touch, can't they? So um, yes. a, few, a few questions around cost. Are you good to have a... Oh, um, I don't know the details on cost. I know we, they're looking at a subscription model, so... Mm -hmm. There are customers. Oh, Rich, I hear your voice as well. So I don't know if you have more of an insight. <clears throat> uh, yes, I mean, it, it is a subscription model. Um, actually. Yeah, it, it's a subscription model. Um, there we go. I should be there in a second. Ah, there you go. Hi. Uh, yeah, it's a subscription model. Um, some of those final costings are yet to be organized. Um, but it will be a, a monthly subscription fee. So it's not for sale at this moment in time. It's a rental model. And just like a professional pest control contract, then a rental model across three years will probably be more cost effective than one across 12 months. And 40 monitors would work out at a better rate than 10 monitors, I would expect. Like I said, neither of us is the project lead on this, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, scale and time frame really that so it, it i think every you know i think every situation needs to be looked at by gary initially so it, it will be contact gary and give him the parameters of what you want to do but i think it is important to take out of this that it is a it, it you know it is a rental model it's not for sale so it you will be looking at a monthly or annual fee something like that so that's the way that the system will be set up great fabulous 
Thank you, Richard. Appreciate that. Um, in terms of, also we mentioned slugs earlier, but uh, any other activation risks like cats, dogs, other humans in the area? Yeah, so this is this is one where you're, you're kind of getting to know your site. So if you've got a cat kind of, I've watched, watched a lot of cat videos on the internet, and if, if you've got a kind of cat reaching in and doing this and going through the beam, it will take that as a probably vibration read and a sensor read. So yeah, yeah. that would be something you would, that would give you a, a, a false positive. Same with like a, if a person kicks it, that's probably going to give you a vibration one and not a, a movement one. So yeah, mm -hmm. there are things that can set them off. So it is about just like you would with traps kind of thing, it's setting it in the right location that's not going to be disturbed mm -hmm. because you want to reduce wherever you can, those kind of things. So I can see it being, you know, set up in a loft. It's unlikely to be disturbed by anything else. But yeah, if, if it gets shaken, that's going to give you a motion, that's going to be a vibration one and not a motion one. But if something goes through and shakes it, then it's going to give yeah. both senses. Yeah. And, and oh, I was going to say now, and you can have either or or both. So you can change the frequency of the sensitivity on one. So if you want to, you can use a trap or a dense side in the box. But you know, so you can have the movement and the vibration. And if you want to be completely assured that you've got something in the box, you don't necessarily have to have an alert unless you've got both together. So there's a lot of flexibility in the box and it allows you to use, if you want to carry on using a trap, you can carry on using a trap because you'll pick up the vibration. If you want to use a rodenticide, then you can continue to use that because we'll pick up the motion as the rodent moves through the box. And the sensitivity, we can vary and change. So if you want to engineer something out of it, like a mouse or it, and you want to pick up rats and vice versa, then we can do that with the sensitivity on the system or just move to one other or both of the of the alerts, the vibration or the motion. So it, you know, we we it that's the flexibility of the system. Really, it allows us to be able to set it to the parameters that you need for the pest you're working with, and we can also set we can also set the 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 frequency of the results as well. So. You know, for example, if you know you've got an infestation, it's probably not worth you getting a message every second a rodent goes through the box. So you can get one every 50 movements or 100 movements, uh, and then you can change that frequency. And you can do all that remotely from the dashboard. You don't have to go to site to do that. You can, you can, you can amend that from the dashboard. Hmm. Can, can you tell the difference between a rat and mouse activity is a question here from someone as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's something, and Gary will know better than either of us with this, I don't think it's something that we've done before, but certainly with a little bit of trial work, you, you, you will be able to do that because you can you can set the frequency and you can set the sensitivity to pick up or miss something. So uh, theoretically, yes, uh, I just don't think we've done the work to that level of sensitivity. It's mostly movement that we're looking for at this moment in time, but with mm -hmm. vibration, uh, I think there's every chance that, that that we could do that, but it would probably be different from site to site because of the other factors such as movement of vehicles, movement of people, that kind of thing. So we have to bear that in mind as well. But you know, the system allows us to to test and trial it, and you know, uh, hopefully we should be able to engineer out the bits of information that you don't want. Mm -hmm. I think I think they're looking to do additional builds in the future. So I don't know whether any of them are confirmed yet, but look, I think they're looking to do additional builds to the sensors that will hopefully allow better see look see between rats and mice so you can get even more data out of it yeah yeah maybe in a little built-in camera we'll have a little nosy at them but i don't know, maybe getting a bit too excited and expensive but <laughs> <laughs> we, we like our cameras these yeah. days don't we um i mean in terms of the um robustness uh, mark's mentioned here that are they rodent proof you just noticed a wire that was inside that could maybe be gnawed i don't know do you have any problems with that that side so when they're in bait boxes, that's that wire is going to be right up inside the bait box. So it shouldn't be the the cable shouldn't be available. But if it was completely loose, then yeah, I guess there's the potential for for gnawing. Mm -hmm. so it would just be about setting it up in the right location. And yeah, right. And weatherproof again. Someone's mentioned on here. I'm guessing the. the so I think they I think you said they're IP or IR65. So that means like weatherproof. Yeah. So yeah. I, I I think you. The, the way that we're working is you'll have a choice of one that is and one that isn't. But if you use the monitor with the, the specialist Syngenta bait box, then it slots inside the box, inside a cradle. So that offers it a level of, of security from the weather. If you want to use the system with other boxes, then you have to retrofit it either on top or inside. So, but yeah, so the, 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 we're working towards two versions. One's weatherproof and one's not. And you can pick and choose which one you want, depending on the site you're working on. Right, environment, fabulous. And what about um, the radius or distance, the, the coverage, the range of the sensors? 
So it's kind of zero and right at the sensor all the way down to about 30 to 40 centimeters. So it's kind of going to go to fan out. So obviously if it's very close, then you need to be right underneath it, but as it'll kind of fan down. So in a box, it'll be more than covering the area, but you just have to be careful if you're setting it independently that you're kind of not going at like 50 or 60 or 70 centimeters because you might miss things underneath. So yeah, that kind of 30 to 40 centimeters being optimum. Right. Um, and then another one about the boxes, batteries, how long, how, how long do they last? So yeah, the, the sensors, batteries, nine years, and then the, the hubs are physically need to be given power. Yeah, yeah, nine years. That's a good, good amount of time, isn't it? But like you say, with the, with the hubs, it can have that, that access there. Um, so how, how does modern office construction impact the transmission of data, given the volume of cabling, steel work, reinforced concrete, things like that? Yeah, the materials will will affect sort of the distance that it's able to to travel. So that's why Gary's going out to a site because he's obviously he's needing to sort of investigate that and how far each one does. But they can do that in the install and they test and they need to install more hubs if you've got very, very thick materials or very, very dense materials. So yeah. shouldn't be a problem in sort of normal office situations. But yeah, in warehouses or situations where we've got very thick steel or very thick breeze blocks, then there's potential that's going to block more signal that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I mean, really good answers there. Just to, to finish off, Martin um, Harvey has put um, some, yeah, sort of feedback, I think, with regards to the um, technology that we've got, and it's really is you know, the future of the industry. He feels, um, and that, and, and you mentioned before with that whole, the way pest controllers see themselves. We're, we're not necessarily, you know, this is not going to take away from what we offer as pest controllers. You know, we're 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 employed to, you know, provide our expertise and our skills and talk people through things and you know yeah. implement you know systems like this on top of everything else that we provide so actually there's nothing to be frightened about with it it's not going to take away from anything it's just going to add no. to you know to our toolbox isn't it really I think I remember when my my grandparents first got smartphones and I was like well they're just going to not be able to do internet banking they just can't I'm just going to have to do all their banking for them but what happened they just made internet phones so good that everyone can use them they just got the technology just got more and more straightforward that everybody was able to use it so the hope is that no one get alienated from the marketplace because if the tool's done right and it's really intuitive then you shouldn't need to be an expert you should just be using it just like you do a standard trap or a standard rodent box it should be that intuitive to use and we think our system is is that that it's easy to use and it's it's kind of normal mm. to understand that it's not impossible to use you don't have to have a degree in engineering science to understand it it should just be something that works with you just like mm. a modern smartphone does yeah i think that's a great point i think the other the flip side of that is that from a professional pest controller point of view it's great to be able to show the end customer that you got have got a level of digital knowledge and you're bringing that so it kind of increases your reputation and 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 your and what the customer thinks of you you're moving away from a physical measure and you're moving on to a digital measure that kind of shows a, a a step change in the delivery of pest services and that really means that it should change the customer's view of the professional pest controller because they're providing a digital service not just a physical service so they're getting something more out of the pest control you know so this this digital service that it's is is kind of really growing the stature of the professional pest controller in the eyes of the end customer they become not just a technician but a specialist in digital as well and i think that's important because we've seen that happen in a lot of other work areas and i don't see why it shouldn't happen in professional pests to be perfectly honest we deserve that that status with the end user customer just like anybody who's dealing with waste or is dealing with the lift shafts or is dealing with uh, air conditioning units we should be seen in on that same level as well, to be perfectly honest. And I think a digital system allows you to move up that level and and, and start to deliver that quite technical level of service that the customer really appreciates. Mm -hmm. I think like auditors and you know um, are, are liking these systems. You know, going to feed out mm. data, but they like to be able to um, you know see that these things are being used. I think I think that's the experience. What other people are saying that they're seeing as well. Yeah, great. Definitely. Good. Well, there's no other questions that have come in. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we, we move on? I've got one minute. Speak now, forever hold your peace. No, no, over great. The, yeah. no great. Other than uh, thanks for hosting, Natalie. It's been an excellent event as always. Yeah, it's been it's been a pleasure. Thank you both. Um, and yeah, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. -bye. Great. Okay. So yeah, some yeah, really good questions. Really, really good questions. I think it, it's it's in, encouraging that the you know, the industry is embracing technology and actually seeing it in a more 
uh, you know, in a, in a positive light, just another another tool that we that we can use. So, and we're always pleased at BBCA to hear any feedback that any anyone has on, you know, if you have implemented it, if you have used it, what your customers think. It's yeah, always good to get that feedback. So, great. Okay. Well, without further ado, so um, I'm going to be shooting off in a minute, but before I do, um, Ian Andrew, our CEO, is going to uh, do some association news and industry updates. Hi, Ian. Hi, Natalie. Thanks. Hi. Uh, are you all right? Yeah, all good. Thank you. So fabulous. I'll, I'll leave you to it and I'll just say goodbye to everybody now. Yeah, no, that's great. And thanks for keeping us to time. And I promise I will finish by 12.30. But just a few bits of update, if you don't mind bearing with me. And um, want to speak about qualifications framework, want to speak about glue boards and a few other bits and pieces. Um, I've said before that we're uh, doing a major review of qualifications for the sector and we're working with RSPH and the NPTA on this particular project um, and rather than tweaking the qualifications that have been in place for a very long time we're actually looking at a whole new suite of qualifications for the sector and these new qualifications will assess not just knowledge and understanding that typically is assessed by exams but will actually assess competence, people's ability to do the job. And we'll be looking at much greater um, and different ways of doing these assessments so that people aren't having to sit in an exam condition for three hours to prove that they are competent and able to do the work of a pest controller. So John Horsley's leading the work at our end, <laughs> Graham Turner from NPTA, and our colleagues at RSPH, and we will be coming out to consultation. So uh, these qualifications need to be developed by the sector for the sector. Uh, so do look out for these consultation opportunities as we start to build these new qualifications. And please do participate because the, these new qualifications need to be fit for purpose. And they'll be with us for the next five, 10, 15 years. So it's important we get them right. So please do give them your time as the consultation events happen. On glue boards, um, we did an update this week from DEFRA, just confirming that Natural England will officially and legally take over the responsibility for rodent glue trap licensing from the 13th of June this year and that the licensing scheme goes live on that date and the applications for license can be received from that date and that from the 31st of July, the use of glue boards can only be undertaken under a license and it will only be professional pest controllers that can be licensed. Everyone else is, will be banned from the 31st of July. We should see the principles of the scheme, i.e. how the scheme is going to work next week. And obviously, once we've had sight of that, then we'll share any information that we have. Uh, we've been inputting as they've been developing the scheme to ensure that it is workable, practicable, um, and we've we've got some assurance that that will be the case. I you're not going to have to wait to get a license. That you will be licensed, um, but there will be elements of recording the use, reporting on the use, etc. So that detail we should see next week, and obviously we will be um, <clears throat> sharing whatever we find out next week. Uh, but glue boards to be banned. Um, for public use, and certainly we'll be working with eBay and Amazon and other online retailers to make sure that that ban on public use and public sale is effective. In Wales, you'll be aware they're already banned, um, but we are still seeking feedback. I've got a couple of the major retailers who um, are looking to provide feedback, but if any pest controllers on the ground in Wales have been having issues caused by the ban there, then please do feed that feedback through. 
Scotland, we managed after a lot of time and effort to get an amendment into the Wildlife Management and Muirburn Bill that was passed by the Scottish Parliament on the 21st of March this year. We're now waiting royal assent so that the bill will become an act, but effectively the bill allows for a scheme for pest controllers to continue to use rodent glue boards to protect public health. Now, what that scheme looks like still needs to be determined. I have written to Jim Fairley, the member of the Scottish Parliament and minister responsible for the development of the scheme, and we will get a scheme that, uh, again, is workable and practicable, but more details on that to follow. Uh, we've no indication yet of what the likely implementation date of the scheme will be, but clearly the Scottish Government's going to need time to work with us to build that scheme. So more on that as it progresses. Um, just a call out of some thanks. Um, our Academic Relations Working Group did the Future of Pest Management Survey at the end of last year that gave us a whole load of useful data. And in fact, some of the data from that uh, survey was actually used in the debate in the Scottish Parliament on the licensing for glue traps in Scotland. So again, thanks to everyone that participated in that. Our academic relations working group are currently working on a set of um, research projects that we'll be putting out to universities to try and engage university students in pest management and hopefully drive their awareness of pest management as a potential career option. And again, more on that as that project progresses. For those of you that attended PestEx, thank you for attending. Uh, thanks to all the visitors, all the exhibitors, all the seminar uh, people that um, made it a really exciting and positive event. A date for your diary is PPC Live that will be returning to Harrogate next March. So that's the 19th of March, 2025 for PPC Live in Harrogate. And then we'll be back in London in 2026 for Pest X. A few plugs on some training that's coming up. If you're considering uh, adding fumigation to the range of services that you currently provide, we've got fumigation classroom course coming up in May, 13th to 16th of May. Also, if you've got anyone needing qualified in general pest control level two, it's a course coming up in June, 2nd to 7th of June at Yarnfield. A couple of online courses that may be of interest to people, one on becoming a field biologist and technical inspector on the 8th of May, that's a Zoom course, and one on managing pest control contracts on the 10th of June. Um, Natalie mentioned uh, webinars. We've got integrated insect management coming up on the 8th of May. Uh, these are only available to BPCA members. So again, please do um, join that webinar if you can. If not, it will be rec recorded and access available afterwards. We've got some physical events coming up. Uh, Natalie mentioned we're in Cardiff next Wednesday, the 24th of April, for a forum. And we're then in Nottingham on the 22nd of May for a forum. These are the usual half-day physical events. So 24th of April in Cardiff, 22nd of May in Nottingham. And next digital forum will be on World Pest Day on the 6th of June. Um, so again, a date for your diary. We're doing a series of our, what I call curry in a pint evenings, the more informal networking evenings, and they're open to both members and non-members. And the next one of those is in May, up in Chorley, northwest of Manchester, on the 15th of May, evening event. Uh, no, nothing formal, just an opportunity to meet other pest controllers in that area. So again, uh, there's a series of these. You can find the other ones on the website. All that remains is to say thank you. Thank you to our sponsors today, Syngenta, 
um, without their support, these things wouldn't happen. And obviously our speakers, Richard from Syngenta, Fred from Pest West, Matt from Killjarm, and Sean uh, from Syngenta. Um, really appreciate great sessions today. Uh, and thank you for your engagement in the questions that you posed to the speakers as well. Uh, thanks, obviously, to Natalie and the BPCA team for making all this happen. And thanks to you for taking a morning out. It's always appreciated uh, that you can join us on these uh, digital forums. But thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. OK, thanks, folks, and goodbye.